Good morning and welcome to Skipton Baptist Church Online. We are continuing our look at the life of Moses and we're progressing this week. Um, we're skipping past some uh, classic parts of the story, the Red Sea splitting and a few other events, which we may circle back to in the following weeks. But today we're looking at uh, whenever the people have arrived at Sinai and God is giving them their laws, giving them his rules. Now, I was um, away in the summer in Paris uh, for a couple of days, and we managed to go to uh, the Louvre in Paris. <clears throat> and in there, in uh, one section, the Babylonian section, there is what's called the Law Code of Hammurabi. Now, this is a, a law code from the Babylonian period. It's one of the oldest law codes that's in existence. It's talking about 1800 BC, so nearly 4,000 years old, outlining lots of rules and regulations about how society should work. Society needs rules, it needs laws, doesn't it? And it's so easy, especially in this day and age, to feel that, that rules can be restrictive to my personal growth, development and path, that rules can in some ways be negative. But the truth is, good rule of law is a blessing. Have you ever played a game and in the midst of that game, someone just doesn't play it right? Uh, at the very least, it's frustrating, which may lead to some fallings out. In a bigger scale, laws and rules are needed both personally and in society. And we come to the laws that are outlined in the laws of Moses, Exodus chapter 20 to 23. Um, this is a set of laws which are actually expanded upon in the book of Leviticus and repeated in the book of Deuteronomy before the people go into the promised land. And if you've read through them, you know that, first of all, there's lots of laws from the very familiar Ten Commandments to pages of others. Some uh, reasonable ones that you might recognise and find absolutely understandable. Some which in modern day understanding may seem controversial or frankly a little bit bizarre to our understanding. I mean, how many of us really particularly enjoy cooking young goats in its mother's milk? But I hope this morning to address the question of how we should regard and respond to the laws in the Old Testament, often called the laws of Moses or the Torah. Should we obey them? Should we enforce them upon society? Should we adapt them or select them or just completely ignore them? Because the alternative to um, no rules is anarchy where you choose to do whatever you want, which on the surface can sound great until you're affected or hurt by someone else's choices. Anarchy leads to situations where the strong exploit the weak without any accountability or repercussions. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and a survival of the strongest. And the Hebrew people at this point in the story are a mere 50 days out of a situation of slavery where their very lives were at the whim of Pharaoh and those in power and authority over them. They had no uh, comeback upon any of these actions. To these people, the Ten Commandments and the rest may well have sounded initially like a manifesto of freedom. Boundaries were set in place by a higher authority, God, to whom all were accountable, weak and strong, which included directives which protected the vulnerable and the weak, put limits on work and had provision for justice and restitution when needed. And the people needed these boundaries because they were a new people. After several hundred years in servitude to the directives of Egypt, what did it mean to be the people of God? So in working out how we should relate to the laws of Moses, those are the things we need to remember. Firstly, to recognise that these words that are written in Exodus uh, 20 through to um, Deuteronomy, including Leviticus, were written to a particular people at a particular time within a completely different cultural and historical context to us. This was 3000 plus years ago in the Arabian Peninsula. It was an agriculture, an agrarian culture. It was nomadic um, it was non-literate, it was patriarchal, which not it wasn't always necessarily a source of oppression. It was religiously diverse with competing surrounding deities. And it's important to note it was also a barbaric culture. That was a way of life. And these newly freed, freed slaves in this um, matrix in which they were in needed new sense of, of identity, discovering who this God of their fathers really is. They were a new people. And what did it mean to be this new people? Needless to say, all that 
situation and context is incredibly different to our own. So remembering that may well help us when reading some of the laws which appear strange or maybe irrelevant to us, although some of the laws, including laws about mould and even bodily fluids, actually can be suggested as a very early health and hygiene um, pre preventative measures to prevent mass contagion in a tented community. There's some wisdom behind it as well. But it's not just a different historical context. We're also talking about a different stage in God's story, the, the story of salvation, the story of redemption and revelation. As we touched on when we looked at Moses at the non-burning burning bush, the people were discovering about who this God was, who the God of their fathers was. And in Exodus 24, after Moses has read the law as it was at that point, the people agreed this was the start of their covenant but this is what we now know uh, as as the old covenant this is not the covenant that we come under because of the coming of jesus jesus has come much longer much further in the story of redemption than we are at this moment here jesus spoke of the new covenant in luke 22 the old covenant was sealed by the blood of a sacrificial bull in exodus 24 jesus says the new covenant is sealed by his blood as we hear and we remember it every communion and we'll unpack this a little bit later on maybe. So why this old new dichotomy? Well we have different stages of relationship don't we and this is really early baby Israel and when we're parent and child uh, demographic uh, parent and child relationships they change they change over time and when uh, when young uh, parents impose lots of rules on you, really strict rules like don't go out of my sight, ask before you leave the table, don't tell lies. All these are really good things in themselves. But as an adult, you no longer, hopefully, need those specific rules to be recited to you. They're either no longer pertinent to your situation or the principles which they were teaching you've internalized and you no longer have to stay within the sight of your parents in order to stay safe. You can do that yourself. And in a similar way, the entire specifics of the law of Moses is no longer necessary as the Holy Spirit now internalizes God's will to us. As we read in Jeremiah 31, which is echoed in Hebrews chapter 8, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. The law of Moses seen here in Exodus 20 and following chapters in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we can hopefully see and understand that they were, they were God's laws for the people in this particular context around 1500 BC. But they were relevant to a particular stage in the unfolding story of God's salvation and the unfolding revelation of who God is. So taking that into consideration, do we just ignore these nearly two and a half books full of rules and just remove them from the pages of Scripture? Well, I don't think so. Uh, but we're not the first to suggest that a guy called Marcion in the early church actually did this and produced a Bible with only an edited version of Luke's Gospel and some edited versions of Paul's Gospels removing any reference to the Old Testament at all. Notice that was actually rejected. So what use are these laws within the Old Covenant if we're living under the New Covenant now? Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 15, he says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they may they provide us, we may have hope. We may be free from the obligation to follow the laws of Moses and every one of those specific ordinances, but it still matters because it still informs us of some significant things. The key one being that the law reveals something of who God is and what his way is like. The law is important because it reveals who God is. It speaks of his person, his priorities, his purposes for his people and the pattern for how he wants his people to live. They express something of God's eternal will and character, what's important to him and to the establishing of his people. And something which I think is really key in our understanding of the law and the commandments is how we view them. They are not some kind of tick list of how to become the people of God. Notice that at the beginning of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter uh, 20, God st starts by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. 
They were already God's chosen people. He had called them. He had brought them out of slavery into freedom. So these commands are not given to qualify them to become the people of God, but to show them what it means to be the people of God. It's not a checklist of how to become the people of God, but a, a checklist of how to be the people of God. And this is important for us even today. I think many of us still think we need to meet some kind of moral or spiritual threshold or pass mark to be included, to be good enough for God's people in order to qualify. And the truth is, because of Jesus, you are already qualified. You are already included because of what he has done. God says, I am your God. You are mine. And then these laws show you what it means to be the people of God, to be my people. This is what it looks like. This is what's important to me. We start off with the Ten Commandments, which are really, really familiar, aren't they? But they're only labelled that on our on our Bible publishers. It's called the Decalogue, Ten Words. And some writers suggest that the better way of looking at these is not the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Definitions, describing how the people of God are to be. Remember, this is the very start of the formation of God's people, from slavery into freedom into a land of promise, called to live his way in a way so different to the standards of the surrounding nations. They are meant to, these laws are meant to be a blessing to them and showing them what God is really like. And they are meant to be a blessing to others in the surrounding nations, demonstrating this character of who God is. This is the purpose of Israel. So although these commandments and laws are specific to the people at this time, they are also meant to show something of God who is at the heart of them. One commentator on Exodus writes that we need to work backwards from the law of Moses to find God's will, his eternal heart, and then work forward to see how it applies to us. And we've got a couple of examples. The first one is in Exodus 21. Now, it talks about the goring uh, bull. Now, not many of us keep cattle these days, let alone running the risk of a bull goring another person. But it was a clear and present hazard in an agricultural society of ancient Israel. But the command expresses that accidents do happen and that people shouldn't be punished for genuine accidents. However, if the accident could have been foreseen and prevented by certain measures which weren't taken, then the person is liable. Yes, here we have one of the earliest examples of a health and safety policy. And I'm not actually joking because... The provisions in these laws reflect something of God's compassion, his nature, his concern for his people's well-being, for justice, for fairness. Laws which set out boundaries to protect the vulnerable, the weak and to avoid exploitation. And they were pretty radical in their time. Another example is slavery. And this seems very controversial, doesn't it, with all the the remembrance of, of the slave trade, the appalling slave trade. But what we need to remember that in the pages of of the Old Testament here, that when we speak of slavery here in this context, it's more akin to indentured service, a way of someone working their way out of debt and difficulty through the employment of another. And within these laws, we see the commands to treat the servants well, to give them rights, to help them get out of their situation, not to trap them, to exploit them. And ultimately, it's seen later on in Leviticus, we see that every seven years in the Jubilee, they would be freed and established for themselves. Another example is eye for an eye. We know about this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. And we think about it, that it's this thing about vengeance, but it's not. It was about ensuring that the penalty does not exceed the crime. In fact, there's no real evidence that these penalties, eyes for eyes, teeth for teeth, were actually carried out that often. It was likely there was some kind of financial redeeming that happened instead. But what it was is this symbol of the the, the punishment, the penalty shouldn't exceed the crime. We're looking at justice and fairness. Now, you take that. It's not difficult to read the law of Moses and distill from it God's eternal way, not locked in the specifics of that uh, second millennia BC um, people, but actually discerning God's will and his way, which applies to our lives. And, and if we can't distill that, Jesus actually does it for us. Someone comes up to him and we read about it in Mark chapter 12 and asks him, what is the most important command? 
And Jesus says these familiar words. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. And in Matthew's version of it, it says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is God. This is Jesus revealing the core, the heart of the law. And I think the law, as we see in scripture, comes layered to us. At the heart of it is who God is, his character, his person, his priorities, his purpose, his patterns. But how that is worked out within us, for us, is summed up in what we call the golden rule, the greatest commandment, Mark chapter 12. Love God with all you've got and all you are and love others as you love yourself. And then beyond that, we have the general overview of what this means, the non-specifics. And the example are the Ten Commandments, those ten rules that kind of dictate the basics of, of the society in which God's people should live in. And then we have the more specific contextual, the law of Moses in Exodus, Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. What these core commands look like worked out at a specific people at a specific time. But even beyond scripture, we then go on to Jewish teachings, the Midrash, the Mishnah, the Talmud. We have rabbis, particularly two schools, Hillel and Shammai, who interpreted the scriptures and gave their own teachings. And we know that Jesus in his day was coming across loads of Jewish teachings, which were in excess of the laws that were laid down. But we also have our rules, the rules that we imp imply on people. Worship style, dress, traditions, Bible translations, behaviour acceptable or not. And it's important in this layering of the law that we think about the direction of travel with the law. If it's outside in, the first thing we come across are the rules, the rights, the wrongs, the ins and outs, the good and the bad. And these can so easily become a solid, impenetrable barrier to getting to the heart of God. And this is what Jesus collided about with the religious leaders of his day, which the early church wrestled with in their becoming open both to Jews and to Gentiles, while people were trying to drag them back to following all of the law. And even today within the church, that's the outside in. Whereas I believe we're called to be inside out. We start with who God is, his character, his nature, his, his nature, which is cross-destined, sacrificial love lived out and exemplified in Jesus, on whose pattern we are to follow, inspired and enabled by his Holy Spirit in accordance with his word, the inside out, starting with God and applying it through his spirit to our lives. So we have the rules that God gives that reveal something of who he is and how um, he wants his people to be. The laws we've seen show this about who God is but whilst it does it it also reminds us also gives a lot of permit a provision for when God's people do not match up with what they should as we said we need laws don't we otherwise we do end up in a state of anarchy so my question to you is are you a rule keeper or a rule breaker now stereotypically people often say the British are rule keepers and the evidence of this is our preponderance to uh, to queue and not to jump the queue. Now you may consider yourself a rule keeper, but I'm gonna show you something which reaches to us at a deep unconscious level to reveal that no matter how well behaved we are, there is still an instinct to break the rules. Don't walk on the grass. Have you ever seen these signs and something inside you just wants to put your foot on that grass? just to see what happens. The law reveals in a similar way that we are rebels against God. The fact that we have these laws, including the specific examples that we have penalties and restitution guides and later on the sacrificial system for when the law is broken. It shows us, first of all, that all these things, all these law breaking was happening. Otherwise, there'd be no need for the laws themselves. The other thing that it shows us is that God is not surprised by our sin and by our disobedience. Tim Chester in his commentary on Exodus writes about this. He said, Jesus accepts the realities of life in a fallen world without actually condoning fallen behavior. There is an accommodation to these realities in this world with an attempt to limit the harm 
caused by sin. That's what we see as the law is put out there. The the law reveals to us how we go wrong. In Romans 3 verse 20 it says, Therefore no one can be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. Have you ever been doing something, I don't know, something like maybe baking a cake and you're sure you know how to do it, but every time you do it, it seems to go wrong. So you you try it again and again and the same things go wrong again and again. And it's only by going to a recipe you realise what you were doing that was wrong and why you were experiencing the consequences you were and ultimately how you should be doing it to get the right results. The evidence of our rebellion, our human rebellion, is seen clearly within a few chapters of Exodus. In chapter 20 to 23, the law is given. In chapter 24, the people agree to the covenant. We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. And by chapter 32, as Moses has been away for longer than they expect, the rebellion kicks off and they demand and they make an idol of the gold that they took from Egypt. And this is their God. And and, and this is important because it reminds us, the law reminds us of the seriousness of sin, the penalties to prevent it, the warning of consequences and the danger of the contagion of sin. It takes sin seriously, but it also counters denial and ignorance where we pretend that we're not sinful, the way we put our, our, our hands over our eyes and cover our ears to pretend that we don't know. And a writer once once wrote, we will never know forgiveness and freedom until we face the reality of sin. But the, the law also reminds us of our inability to keep the law and to be the people God wants us to be. The law demonstrates something of the heart of God, his pattern for his people. But we recognise it also shows us that we are inherently rebellious against God and his ways. And and that this will always create distance between a holy God and a sinful people. And even the penalties, the restitutions and even the sacrificial system can never bridge that chasm fully. But these consequences of sin, the penalties, remind us that there is a price, a consequence to our sins and our sinful choices. We need to be saved. We need to be helped. We need to be redeemed. And whilst the law demonstrates our failure to keep God's pattern, it also points to a way that it can be made right. In Deuteronomy, as Moses is reminding the people of the law before they cross the Jordan into Canaan, he outlines the results of being an obedient people of God and of being an unfaithful people. He demonstrates this in a series of blessings for obedience and curses for not following the law. And he presents them to the people as a choice. It's your decision to follow or not. Blessings or curses, life or death. And it's useful to know that when we read of these punishments and penalties outlined in in the law of Moses, often what we see are warnings of the consequences of sinful and sin-fueled actions. Sin leads to pain, leads to suffering, disconnection with other people and insecurity and disestablishing of really harmonious society. And it still does. It's one reason why God takes it so seriously, why he wants uh, three warnings for us to avoid it, literally avoid it like a plague. And we may think that God punishes his people for their sins. The reality is more often that the consequences of our sinful choices are punishment in and of themselves and enough. The the curses Moses outlines culminate ultimately in exile and death. A loss of the closeness with God and the life which comes from it. Jesus alone has kept the law of God. He alone has been righteous. And the amazing thing is that the blessings that he merited come to us because we are in him by faith. 1 Corinthians and 1 says it is because of him that you are in Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. His righteousness, holiness and redemption is ours. On the other hand, we've broken God's law, but the curse we deserve fell on Jesus as he died in our place. So Jesus sets us free from the condemnation of the law. 
Romans 8 says, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We no longer have to obey the law of Moses, of the old covenant, because they have been matched. They've been fulfilled by Jesus. But we don't ditch them because it shows us so much of who God is, so much about ourselves, but it also shows us so much of what Jesus has done for us. The law is important, Jesus says so. In Matthew 5, he says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So in saying all of this, that God's law is based on love God and love other people. It can be misunderstood that we're toning down the severity and the strictness of the law. But again, in in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus completely dispels that with a series of of sayings where he says, you've heard it said, but I say this. You've heard it said, do not murder, but I say, don't even hit. You heard it said, do not commit adultery. I say, don't even have lustful thoughts. Don't dwell on them. This is not about just an an outward legalistic compliance, but about an inward spiritual transformation. Not only about our actions, but our attitudes, our hearts. And with this, we see that none of us can live up to God's standards in our actions or even in our thinking. How does Jesus fulfill the law? First of all, Jesus embodies the heart of God's pattern, which is seen within the law. He is God's law in action. What we read about in scriptures that are codified in the Ten Commandments, exemplified in the specifics of the law of Moses, they are personified in Jesus. You know that we set up the Renew Wellbeing Space. And it's interesting, we read the books, we talked about it, we we saw the presentations, we heard the stories, but it was only when we saw it in action that we actually really get it. And similar to Jesus, We don't get it from just looking at the words on the page. We see it by seeing Jesus living out the pattern God wants his people to live. And as we see Jesus in the Gospels and revealed by his spirit, we see the heart of God, God's law in person, in action, showing us what it looks like. But Jesus is not only the pattern that we need to follow, but he is the one who makes it possible for us to have the closeness that the law promised but that our sinful nature could never deliver. Romans 8.3 says, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. We see in the law's provision, a provision for atonement, making things right with God through ritual and sacrifice, but that was never enough. The sacrificial system was a pre-echo of the cross, just as the blood over the doorpost of Passover was too. And we read about this particularly in Hebrews, which deals with the, the growth of the new covenant from the old and how Jesus fulfills and completes it. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by sacrifices that are repeated and on end, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Jesus is the once and for all perfect sacrifice. It says in Hebrews again, he sets aside the first covenant to establish the second. And by that, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So how do we relate to the law? of Moses, what we read in Exodus, into Leviticus, and in Deuteronomy. The Old Testament law in all its varied forms and varied rules and commands, the warnings, the penalties, the promises of blessings, was given to God's people at the very outset of their being, of being a new nation. They were not the way to become the people of God, but the way to be the people of God, and it still is. And these specific laws reflect behind them the character of God, his priorities, his plans, his patterns for his people to bless them and in order for them to demonstrate who God is to surrounding peoples that they may be blessed too. And the outward compliance of these laws, it became the focus for Israel and they lost the heart of it. God's heart embedded within them and these laws became barriers to people coming to God. And whilst laws are a touchstone to how to be the people of God and for us, 
It was also meant that it was clear when God's pattern is not followed. Words and actions, they may have agreed with God's covenant initially, but ultimately we see time and time again in Israel's story and maybe even in our own lives how instinctive it is to disobey the heart of God's commands. And for us, we see something of God's nature underpinning this law of Moses, the heart of which Jesus distills by saying, love God with all you are and love others as you love yourself. And the entirety of God's law was personified in Jesus, who through his perfect obedient life won for us the blessing of closeness to God and eternal life, while by taking the consequences of our fallen rebel nature, he endured the curse of exile and death for each one of us. This is the new covenant, the covenant we live in, sealed not with bull's blood and stone tablets, but with his blood, a covenant, a law not written on tablets of stone, but embedded within our hearts by God's Holy Spirit. May we see within the law of God something of his holiness and awareness of our fallenness, the ugliness and damage of sin, but the pattern, priorities and person of God and the beauty of Jesus and righteousness by which we can share in his blessings because of his love and grace. May we know the beauty of that love and grace as we see and read the law of God. Thank you.